what comes after Rome? What was the civilization that followed Rome? Uh, and uh, as what we'll see today, and uh, what's very, uh, uh, what really, uh, in essence, uh, is the core of this empire, is that the Byzantines were just a small portion, a rump, really, is what people say, of what used to be the Roman Empire. Uh, in uh, the eastern half, approximately, of what uh, Romans once had. Uh, and although we as modern historians will go ahead and refer to this as being a new empire and a new people, the people living within the Byzantine Empire did not feel that they were new at all. Uh, they felt that they were the same exact empire. Uh, they continue to refer to themselves as the Roman Empire, and they continue uh, to refer to themselves the entire history of this empire as being Roman. Uh, so it would have been very strange for them to just hear themselves spoken about as Byzantine, for the Byzantine Empire. All right. Now, we had said that um, earlier um, that Rome had ended up um, facing a series of existential threats uh, that hit it in the late Roman period. We talked a lot about these various things, especially some of um, the invaders, uh, that these military threats that would come from the outside. Uh, and uh, what we first spoke about a little bit less, though, uh, was that Roman generals made a concerted effort to try to save what they could. And uh, when they were thinking about how to direct uh, their military, um, one of the real um, the guiding principles was try to save some of these eastern provinces, which in many cases were actually among the richest. Uh, and uh, that is why you actually end up seeing uh, a portion of Rome, uh, a small portion in comparison to the height of Rome which reached, but it still remains in Roman hands and it still has this sort of continuity in the ancient world. And then here I'm just, um, it's actually a little bit difficult to show you what the Byzantine Empire looks like at, uh, throughout its entire history because its map changes over time. Uh, but some of the territories I'm showing you here uh, were the were really Byzantine for the majority of its history, including uh, very important for uh, this empire, uh, the country of modern day Turkey, uh, modern day Greece, the Balkans, um, portions of Syria, and in fact, even for a good amount of time, portions of southern Italy would all remain under the sway of this empire. That's really the, the core. So notice now, um, Rome has essentially relinquished control, um, not on paper, but in reality, it has relinquished control over a lot of its Western territories. It also has, as we discussed earlier, a new capital city, which is the city of Constantinople, which, as we had said earlier, had been founded by our friend Constantine here, uh, but now uh, really serves as uh, the, the command center for a new empire. Uh, and uh, really, um, we think that Constantine had chosen quite well. Uh, as I said, primarily the location of this new capital city was dictated by uh, military terms. It was easy to defend. But um, it actually ends up being a fantastic position because, in fact, Constantinople in time is going to become this huge hub of a, basically a shipping network, of a, of a, a network of merchants. Uh, and it's actually going to be a lot easier to get to content local the territory um, further east, which is useful. Here's just a, an image, a uh, medieval image of what content local looks like, uh, which becomes a huge city, uh, the, the center of the government. And as I said, um, the kind of city that all sorts of outsiders will come to trade on on a regular basis. Uh, in many respects, though, as I mentioned, um, Although so much about uh, Rome is going to fall away, at uh, least for people living within this empire, uh, they themselves felt uh, that many of the same things that made Rome great, uh, having good roads, for instance, they continue to have good roads, uh, having uh, a very strong emperor, having civic processions like this one, for instance, uh, these are all things uh, that are uh, really kept up completely. Uh, in this new empire, as if nothing has changed. And in fact, um, it was striking to us too that, again, this, uh, the emperor now, 
Uh, and uh, really, I don't have to introduce this government much because this was basically the same exact government in the late Roman world. This very powerful emperor that we've seen, especially starting with uh, Diocletian, uh, really has uh, the same exact authority under this new empire. And uh, some people would call this basically, uh, basically an autocracy, a uh, completely one man rule. Uh, there's not even a fiction anymore in the Byzantine world. Uh, that um, other politicians have any power anymore. It really all circulates around the emperor. Uh, and uh, so the emperor, too, uh, we know, um, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, uh, not only is he powerful, uh, but in a lot of his propaganda, he constantly talks about how he has divine favor uh, for his empire. Uh, and in this case, not by the gods with the capital, with a, a mess, but uh, with, by God, uh, by the Christian God now, uh, is the one blessing him, uh, allowing him to rule. So, for instance, uh, Byzantine emperors will often issue coins like this one. Um, on the one side, it shows uh, the face of the Byzantine emperor. On the other side, Jesus Christ. Uh, so you get very, get very clear this kind of connection between the two of them. Um, that's on purpose. And, uh, uh, it, it may be strange to our ears, but uh, the Byzantine emperor often felt that uh, really basically that the church was a department of state. It was one of the many things that he, uh, he oversaw. Yeah. Well, even see emperors sometimes intervening in theological debates, which we may say, hey, that doesn't appear like something the emperor should be doing. But the Byzantine emperors felt that this was just one more thing that they were supposed to take care of. Keep Christians in line, other Christians in line. Um, Byzantine emperors, we think, um, loved all of those signs and symbols of authority that late Roman emperors had developed. Uh, they liked to, uh, to to prance around in extremely elaborate uh, outfits, especially uh, wearing purple, which can be seen at a great distance and show you which one is the emperor, essentially. Uh, but all sorts of gold and silk, uh, all of these things that normal people could never afford, of course. And, uh, we think, too, uh, that uh, um, when you got close to the emperor, um, there were all sorts of rituals that you had to do, uh, including uh, uh, getting down on your feet and kissing his foot. Um, because that's how good you were in comparison with the emperor. And. Uh, it, it, we really see that um, um, uh, the emperors too uh, oversee um, really. Again, uh, this is a one-man rule, but and uh, they very carefully oversee uh, all of the different areas of state. A uh, large bureaucracy, for instance. Um, uh, for instance, uh, right here, you see some of the uh, uh, the bureaucrats that serve the emperor. Uh, he oversees the army, and again, notice here he also oversees the clergy. Uh, those are all things. And that's the only person at the center of all this uh, is the emperor. He's the one who, uh, uh, who brings all these different worlds of the state together in one man. And that's the way that the Byzantines view the world, uh, view the universe is very simple. Uh, there is one God in heavens. Uh, there is one emperor here on earth. There is one Christian people underneath the emperor. Uh, and uh, everyone else was basically could be excluded from that vision. I should say too, um, I talked about emperors, uh, but um, there are also as many empresses uh, in this two world go to uh, great power as well in connection with their husbands. Uh, and uh, many of them will also, uh, like Theodora here, uh, will uh, maintain their own courts, have all sorts of uh, um, female, uh, uh, female servants who will wait upon them as well. Uh, so, um, and they, they too, you had to treat with the, the same sort of level of respect and ritual uh, that was afforded to emperors in this world. You can't talk about every single emperor here, but the most important early Byzantine emperor, and the one who really helps to give shape to this position, uh, is this man in this ivory pound here. Uh, this is Justinian, who's shown here in particular as a warrior. Justinian himself was uh, 
most people tend to think this absolutely tireless, uh, energetic emperor. Uh, in fact, some of his uh, enemies claim that he must be half demon, or because of, they've never seen a man with so much energy. Which was not true, uh, but uh, you can just see how they describe it. Uh, Justinian himself um, came from, we think, really obscure origin, probably. Um, his family was not really far removed from being peasants. Uh, but uh, we do think that he himself um, had actually uh, done a lot of work in the imperial bureaucracy. He knew the government very well. Uh, he had gotten very good education uh, and eventually was able to take the power of emperor. <clears throat> Justinian thinks that one of the things that you have to do is emperor, and he's certainly not the only one as a Byzantine. I think that what you have to do is show off your wealth constantly. Uh, you have to, and uh, he really pours all kinds of money in Constantinople to show that this is a truly imperial city uh, in terms of its grandeur. And uh, we can't go to everything he did in, in particular, but one of the things uh, that he had built uh, is actually still standing to this day. And uh, this is uh, what used to be a church. Um, known as Hagia Sophia, a term uh, that means holy wisdom. And that should show you, by the way, that uh, uh, these were people who really felt that uh, Christianity and learning could go together. And that they're really reflecting the sort of a biblical book of wisdom, for instance. Um, uh, Hagia, uh, I should say, by the way, this is what the Hagia Sophia looks like today. Um, the minarets were put up uh, in. Uh, after uh, Muslims would take this city, so they were not there during the Byzantine period. I was known for having an enormous dome. I was known too uh, just for uh, uh, the ornamentation inside. Uh, initially, uh, this place would have actually shimmered with gold. Uh, and uh, the way uh, that they built it was really actually quite clever. Um, at the time that they, especially uh, when they were celebrating uh, the divine liturgy, the mass. Um, light would just pour into this uh, this structure uh, all over the place. Uh, so it would have been really quite impressive. Uh, and this shows you, you know, it's nice to have an empire uh, to be able to fund a building of uh, churches rather than buildings. Uh, so this, this church uh, not only is enormous, uh, but again, it's kind of a symbol of the power of this uh, empire. And uh, supposedly, uh, Justinian saw this building the first time after it had been completed. He got down on his knees and said, I have outdone you, Solomon. Uh, because he felt that uh, his church was better than Solomon's temple. Which may be true, but uh, it still wasn't nice to say. We also see that um, Justinian felt that a great emperor ought to have a great law code. And uh, remember, this is something that we've seen before for Romans. Uh, the Romans love law. They love uh, generating new law. So that was not a new idea. What was new, though, is um, interesting enough, Romans had loved law so much that they had created too much of it. There was a mess of law out there. And um, part of the problem is that no one could exactly tell what the laws were anymore because there were so many different laws. Sometimes they contradicted one another. Uh, sometimes, in fact, there was so much legal commentary, it was difficult for anyone to make sense of. So Justinian had no patience for this. He set up a commission of scholars and said, that's it. Clarify exactly what laws are we going to keep, what laws are we going to get rid of, what is the standard sort of, um, um, sort of a lawyer's book. He had to uh, assemble it in a short number of years, and then he wipes out all other law codes. So there's one law code that he did all his lands. Uh, are held by. We also see that Justinian felt, um, not many Byzantines, uh, that the Byzantines had been unfairly cheated of the land uh, that the, their ancestors, the Romans, had. And so he actually sponsors uh, a series uh, of attempts to reconquer much of the territory in the West. Uh, and. Uh, some of this is extremely successful. Uh, they take back an area of what today is northwestern Africa that had been ruled over by the Vandals, uh, and really a, a, a very uh, uh, very easy battle. 
They also will take the island of Sicily, uh, which uh, is, is really is quite nice, um, but also is agriculturally productive. Um, we do see, however, that uh, um, the Byzantines begin to overstretch their resources. They get involved in a long and really pointless battle in Italy, uh, and uh, they don't end up actually holding much of that territory. Uh, and uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, they will reconquer a portion of Spain, which is so far away from their power base that they can't hold on to it for very long at all. It just disappears. So it was a bit of a waste of resources altogether. All right, although we're talking about losing territories, but Justinian, at the very least, um, held on to a lot of territory in the eastern half uh, of what had been the Roman Empire. The next generation, though, after uh, Justinian is dead and gone, no one had predicted in the Roman world uh, that there was going to be a much bigger gulf on the horizon. And that, that of course, is the gulf we already talked about. Uh, this was the rise of Islam. And uh, we had said that one of the earliest, um, of the earliest sort of um, places uh, that the Muslim advance will settle upon are many of those territories uh, that Rome once held uh, in northern Africa. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, again, in a series uh, of, uh, of brilliant maneuvers, uh, Muslims will end up sweeping through a lot of these territories uh, and taking them all, and in fact, even going all the way uh, up into what today is modern day Spain. Um, many people at the time, after all this happens, in the Byzantine world, they are thoroughly convinced that this the, really the end of the world is around the corner, uh, that um, eventually Muslims will take over everything. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, um, it seemed for a while that their worst fears were confirmed because Muslim uh, soldiers uh, actually uh, begin to uh, put together a navy uh, and they decide to actually go ahead and take the capital city of the Byzantine Empire, the city of Constantinople. Which, if successful, would essentially mean the entire empire would crumble very soon after. Uh, and so um, the Muslim army and navy, uh, they surround the city of Constantinople, and it looks like soon it will fall. Uh, and it is this point, and this is actually one of the very few times in history you can say this is true, uh, the Byzantines pull out a secret weapon uh, that is actually successful. This is when they pull out what is known as Greek fire uh, and use it uh, to ward off the Muslim attack. What is Greek fire? Um, the short answer is no one knows. We don't actually have a good recipe, um, which is probably just as well. Um, the core ingredient we think of Greek fire was probably a highly unrefined form of petroleum. Uh, and so what they would do, as you can see here, is that they would pump it out of, uh, of hoses and they would just set it in the general direction of Muslims, especially their navy. And the good part about um, having this stuff is, of course, uh, petroleum will burn on water. So you didn't actually have to have good aim. I mean, if you got in general direction, things are going to start to go off in flames. Uh, and indeed, that's exactly what happened. Uh, so uh, this, in fact, uh, is uh, one of the reasons why uh, this is able to save their empire. Before anyone asks this question, because uh, I've heard from death, why did this just use this to conquer the entire world, you're thinking? Uh, the answer is um, Greek fire is also very hard to predict. Uh, and um, if, let's say that the, your, you know, the wind should all of a sudden change direction. That same Greek fire that used to be a friend could turn to a foe very quickly because all their boats were also made of wood, so everything would go up in flame. They were just lucky this time that it actually hit the right uh, target, but it didn't have to. The other thing that we think that um, um, the Byzantines um, made very good use of was uh, the mountains in certain parts of the territories they were defending, like in Turkey. Muslims were not used to fighting the mountains, and the Byzantines were. Uh, so actually, that was another uh, one of the things they could use to their advantage. However, all of this was a brush with death, this, uh, uh, this very near sort of conquest by Muslims. And Byzantines at the time, to their credit, actually recognized how close they had come. And uh, they realized that they had to create a new sort of line of defenses 
uh, so this would not reoccur. And so they begin to create um, something that is uh, sometimes known as the theme system for the first time. What is the theme system? What we would do was, and this is actually an entirely new way to, um, to divide up and defend territory, is that the Byzantines chose a group uh, of men who would serve both as generals and governors. And they sent them out to the various areas of the Byzantine world that they refer to now as thieves, these basically small provincial areas. Um, and uh, these generals would have to oversee all areas of government, including, what is very important, defense of those territories. So they would have a general in every single area who could immediately uh, organize an army if need be to respond to invade with the soldiers. And this is actually quite a quite clever part of it. They actually, um, they have peasants now, free peasants. And uh, essentially what they do for these people is they say to the peasants, we're going to give you land. Uh, you have to, you know, of course you can take care of your land to agriculture, but it's yours. Your obligation though is that you have to basically join the army. Uh, and um, whenever we need you, we don't know exactly when, but whenever there's an invasion, you have to go to battle immediately. And so that was the trade-off. But notice this is actually quite clever, though, because these people were defending their own territory. Uh, so they had a lot of reason to want to make sure that invaders were not successful uh, when they were muzzled or otherwise. We think that um, this, this new plan, this new system uh, that was created, uh, allows Byzantines, first of all, simply to ward off later Muslim attacks quite successfully, and then actually begin to turn things around uh, and use some of these armies to go on the offensive again. And I mentioned that portions, uh, they were able to, to take back at least some of the territory that they had lost. This is especially true of all the different um, uh, emperors, the one who was probably most renowned for his military feats in the Byzantine world, is this guy here, known as Basil II. Before I go on, by the way, you'll notice that. I, I just love this. Uh, notice who's, <laughs> uh, the, the throne is coming, I'm sorry, his head got cut off. Cut off. This is Jesus. Obviously, uh, he's kind of dropping the throne down, but he can't quite reach it. So his, uh, the angel has to take the throne and kind of put it uh, on the head of Basil II. But there's no doubt, by the way, where his authority is coming from. Basil II uh, was a, uh, primarily a, a military leader more than anything else. He actually attacks uh, portions of Muslim Syria and takes them. Um, and uh, he actually goes into all sorts of wars in Eastern Europe and begins to really increase uh, the territory under Byzantine control. Uh, that is especially true of um, the kingdom of the Bulgarians. And, uh, as the old story goes, apparently after, uh, there were a lot of bloody battles against the Bulgarians, but uh, finally in one battle in which uh, Basil II was remarkably successful, uh, he ends up actually uh, taking uh, 14,000 prisoners of war. Uh, and um, he decided to uh, blind all of the soldiers, save for every hundredth man, in which he would just allow only blind uh, the soldier in one of the two eyes. So he could lead everyone back to Bulgaria, <laughs> uh, which may be an exaggeration, but uh, it was pretty cool altogether. But effective. Um, and uh, he essentially absorbs all this kind of territory once today is modern day Bulgaria. We also see um, Basil actually, uh, believe it or not, is good at diplomacy. Um, he is good at collecting money, taxing, uh, and uh, really funneling money to culture as well. So there's a a cultured side to, to uh, Basil II as well. Despite all of this success that the Byzantines have, we do see uh, that you might think that um, they would be very close to Western Europeans because, in fact, they had once been part of the same empire with them. Uh, but in fact, it's completely wrong. Uh, and uh, really, what we see now is that. Byzantines constantly feel that Western Europeans are a group of barbarians who have snatched away their territory, uh, and they constantly hate them. Uh, and the hate is returned. 
Um, and uh, it, it really, in many ways, these two worlds have completely uh, gone torn apart from one another. One of the ways that's very obvious is language. Byzantines now use Greek exclusively. Uh, and um, that's not true of Western Europe. Uh, and uh, we think that um, Byzantines tend to essentially think that the Western Europeans are a group of animals who can fight really well, but that's about it. They're brainless and cultureless. Um, whereas um, Western Europeans tend to think uh, that um, essentially the Byzantines were a group of snobs, heretics, uh, they were effeminate and really go around cheating people left and right. So these kind of stereotypes flew uh, in both directions. What no one could deny, though, even though the Western Europeans hated them, uh, was that Byzantines at their height uh, had become filthy rich as an empire. Uh, and uh, in part, this is because they had a very well managed uh, economy. Uh, when it comes to doing agriculture, so they had a constant supply of money from the ground. But it also means, uh, from, uh, from really uh, uh, throughout its history, the Byzantines funnel a lot of money uh, into um, craftsmanship, the artisans. Uh, and so, um, really, we begin to see uh, craft workers who specialize in these very high end items. Um, like, for instance, um, Carving things like ivory here is just one of many examples. Um, they sold things like glass, certain, um, certain uh, forms of linen, uh, jewelry. Uh, they were very good at creating um, gold and silver um, items, and really high-end items as well. Uh, another industry that the Byzantines began to uh, get into, and this is actually a little bit more interesting, uh, is silk, which actually um, not only they produce, but it becomes a government monopoly. The government gets all the money from it. Um, now, all of you are wondering, of course, like, how do Byzantines get silk? Because I had thought that was something that the, the Imperial China kept as a secret. Uh, and uh, the answer is really no one knows. Um, the story that the Byzantines told that there were three monks who went to China uh, and they had these walking sticks that they had hollowed out. And they went to China and they were looking around, they found silkworms and they saw them, and then when no one was looking, they opened up their uh, their, their walking sticks, they stuffed a bunch of silkworms and they closed them up and they just walked on back, you know, before anyone noticed that they were gone. Uh, you can believe that or not. Um, but somehow, uh, the Byzantines did figure out how to produce silk. Uh, so they actually ended up becoming suppliers of uh, silk as well, just like China did. All of these items melt that the Byzantines uh, create these really, uh, their empire becomes this hub for long distance trade. Many people far in the east will actually, the furthest that they will go into the west is Constantinople. And many people uh, from the west, the furthest they will go to the east is Constantinople. So the two can actually meet there and trade some of these luxury items. Um, and really, people, okay, not just Christians either, Muslims will also, um, will also go uh, to uh, other religions as well. Uh, and so, uh, really, uh, in some ways, content will come to the furthest end of the Silk Road, really, you could say. And we do think that Byzantines, too, um, in, in addition to this trading, they have really a, a very strong sort of banking economy. They have all, all sorts of investments you can make. Uh, and partnerships that grew off of uh, among various merchants uh, and artisans. So all this points to a very complex form of economy. And they had a real city, probably one of the, the funnest cities uh, in the world at the time, which is Constantinople. And, uh, um, one of the reasons why we think Constantinople is such a vibrant city uh, is that there was the imperial government there which basically guarantees that there is always a large number of people who have to live there uh, to serve the government. As many as 20,000 people serve the government. Uh, so even them alone was a good number. But then, of course, you get all sorts of other people uh, in the various industries like trading that also want to live in uh, the city, as far as they were concerned. This city supposedly, uh, this is for good, this gives some idea of how large um, the great imperial palace was. 
This city initially, um, there was all sorts of sculpture from the ancient Roman world just out there. There were gardens that you could go walking through. Um, huge palaces uh, by aristocrats. Uh, it was a, a lovely city. It was a, a city, though, that, though elsewhere as in the Byzantine world, though. I would think that largely when it came to the public world, this was a world that was dominated uh, by men. And, uh, in some ways, the Byzantines actually overtake the very conservative attitudes of upper class Greeks, uh, which is to say that women were confined to the home for the most part. Uh, they could never receive male visitors. Um, they often could not attend things like banquets or parties. Uh, there was this real fear uh, that if women did this, uh, they would compromise their honor. So it really was, in some ways, uh, a, a man's world. We know, too, that uh, in the Byzantine world, uh, initially, um, there were all sorts of less privileged dwellings um, that they had. And there really was this concern of having a public life for those people for uh, an attraction to all classes. It was not just a rich person's world. Uh, so, for instance, they still, like ancient Romans, they have city baths that everyone can go to the bath. Uh, they have bars and restaurants, theaters, uh, and uh, they have chariot racing. Here, for instance, an emperor starting a chariot race. This is actually quite interesting that um, Byzantines, uh, because now um, this is a Christian world, uh, they, they now they begin to have... Um, uh, all sorts of um, opposition to doing, for instance, gladiatorial games, where people are getting ripped and lied. I mean, heaven knows why. Uh, but uh, that goes out. However, there was nothing necessarily immoral about chariot racing. You could continue to do that. Uh, so actually, chariot racing, a lot of the energy people used to have for other sports, it all gets funneled now into chariot racing. Uh, you see uh, all sorts of people will bet uh, on, uh, on different horses, uh, there will be people who follow specific teams, uh, and they really become a big fan. There's also a high cultural life in the Byzantine world. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, this is, in some ways, the Byzantines, just like many things, will carry on uh, from things the ancient Greek world. Um, and really, a lot of the literature that uh, we really talked a lot about in this class, that the Greeks produced, you know, uh, Homer. Uh, you know, the great philosophers like Plato, Aristotle. Well, they were written in Greek, and they felt that this is our birthright, and so we want to read these uh, again, make them in the original. And they did, uh, and uh, we know that all of these works were widely circulated. Again, including things like philosophy and science, uh, never really ceased to be read. And, uh, in fact, we tend to think that um, this high culture was very successful in part because. Just to run the government, there had to be a large number of people who were literate. So uh, reading actually was a, a quite popular thing to do. As you can see, many of these uh, manuscripts uh, get beautifully illustrated uh, as well. And, uh, uh, if you have, uh, if you've ever read anything from the ancient Greek world, uh, for the most part, you tend to have Byzantines uh, to thank for it, because they're the ones who tend to preserve this knowledge. Uh, and then you know, really pass it down uh, to the next generation. And, uh, uh, again, we know that uh, uh, really, uh, in many cases, uh, people will write commentaries uh, on some of these ancient Greek works. So they're so fascinated by them, and they really want to talk more about them. Now, as, as I hinted to you um, before, um, the business world is a Christian world, uh, but it is a uh, they take a different direction when it comes to Christianity uh, than most people in Western Europe do. Uh, this is uh, the beginnings of what we usually refer to as the Eastern Orthodox tradition of Christianity. Um, and uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, ideas that would have appeared to be horrific in the West, like for instance that basically the church is under the state. The, 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 the church has to respond to the state, are really totally uncontroversial. Byzantine world. Uh, and uh, what that meant, of course, this is actually a, often a very difficult thing for some of uh, the main bishops of Constantinople, sometimes referred to for the honor of the term a patriarch. Um, and uh, these bishops essentially were handpicked by the emperor, 
as a result of that, they had to take the imperial line on everything, or else they would find themselves out of a job very quickly. Um, you couldn't preach an anti uh, an anti government line in the Byzantine world as a bishop or a priest. It would be unthinkable, really. Um, they really, uh, if they're bishops, there's nothing uh, comparable to a pope. Um, the closest thing is again the bishop of Constantinople, who doesn't really have anywhere near uh, the independent authority that the pope would end up gaining. By far, uh, the most divisive policy of the Eastern Orthodox Church in this period is something known as iconoclasm. Uh, the term iconoclasm means the breaking of images. Although, as you can see, they didn't necessarily have to be broken, um, they could also be whitewashed, or wash, or or they could paint over them. Uh, Byzantines, up until this point, have had a very long tradition of venerating images as a means to get closer to holy people and uh, to God. Uh, but, um, and and uh, this is really, you know, all sorts of um, Byzantine holy people had meditated upon images for a long time. What's very interesting, though, is that increasingly as Byzantines are losing battle after battle against Muslims, um, they begin to ask the question, not just what had gone militarily wrong, but why was it that God had favored the Muslims in battles? And the answer that of many Byzantine theologians was simple. God has favored the Muslims because he took much, they take much more seriously the biblical prohibition against um, making images, um, making images of, uh, of holy people and God. Uh, and maybe that's actually our problem. If we get rid of these, then God will, will favor us again. And so what many Byzantines do, in fact, uh, is actually they will uh, begin to feel that the veneration of icons, these images of holy uh, people, are, uh, are sinful, and they begin to destroy them. Um, now, this was not a policy that was universally popular. In fact, there were many Byzantines who loved their other icons. And in fact, it actually sparks riots in portions of the Byzantine world. In, in time, uh, this battle goes on. Uh, but eventually, the, uh, the the party in favor of icons wins, uh, but unfortunately, uh, not before having destroyed many uh, uh, of we, what we assume all sorts of examples of early Byzantine art we simply don't have anymore. Uh, we also see, um, again, uh, as in the West, we'll talk about later, uh, in this form of Christianity, uh, we see uh, theologians rising to the fore. Um, and uh, in particular, especially with uh, Byzantine theologians, uh, this was a very uh, philosophical form of Christianity and the theology. Uh, they really had read very deeply in Greek philosophers, and they tried to, as much as possible, bring together with Greek philosophers, say, uh, with the truths of Christianity. Um, especially things like uh, arguing endlessly over exactly what was the nature of Jesus. Uh, and uh, these were things that um, really, um, for many Greek theologians, very important. For people in the West, it seemed like a bunch of hair splitting, or they often, uh, some of the, the level of debate. As in the, the Western world of Christianity, Byzantines also gained their own monastic tradition. And in fact, some of the most important uh, of, of Byzantine, uh, Byzantine uh, people in the church were people who were monks. Um, some of whom would live very simply, for instance, like you know, in, in, in the desert. But gradually, uh, they begin to form communities uh, dedicated to things that you probably are familiar with from the Western tradition. Uh, they, they don't have sex. They fast on a regular basis. They say prayers. Um, they live together. They um, don't have much property. Uh, they listen to superiors. All of these things. Uh, and to some degree, um, as I said, uh, you probably know a lot of these things already. Um, well, what is interesting to us is that um, many uh, Byzantine monks were renowned uh, specifically for their ability to meditate very deeply. Uh, some of them were known for their ability to gain this kind of mystical union with God. Uh, but uh, this did not mean, um, it's important to note that um, Byzantine monks felt that you could abandon the world. Uh, and uh, there actually is a tradition of uh, many Byzantine monks 
whenever there's um, a time of distress, like an earthquake or a, a disease spreading, uh, there are many cases in which Byzantine monks will leave their monasteries to, uh, to provide basically social services for people. Uh, so there's also this ideal that you have to help people uh, as well as pursue, uh, pursue God. One group might go to the other. Despite this reputation for holiness, we think that specifically because many of the issues that we've talked about here, um, there are constant tensions between the Eastern Orthodox tradition and um, uh, Christianity as practiced in the West. Uh, iconoclasm is the absolute biggest flare up, uh, but there are all sorts of other issues, uh, some of which um, really uh, tore apart the world of Christianity. Uh, for instance, uh, should you use unleavened or leavened bread in Eucharist? Um, Byzantines felt uh, that, um, uh, that you, you, you could have leaven in your bread. Uh, what was the exact uh, definition of uh, how the different people of Trinity related? The other question, of course, becomes uh, the autonomy of bishops. Um, many people in the Eastern Orthodox world didn't like the idea of having a pope over other bishops. Uh, they felt that every single bishop should be autonomous. Um, ultimately, all of these issues, cutting to the chase here, uh, ultimately all of these issues actually end up producing such a level of acrimony uh, that um, uh, the two churches uh, go into what is referred to as a, a schism, uh, a break between the two. Uh, and, uh, um, and in the year 1054, uh, the two churches uh, end up becoming independent of one another. Um, the, the Pope ended up uh, excommunicating the Bishop of Constantinople and all his followers, and for good measure, uh, the Bishop of Constantinople will excommunicate uh, the Pope and all of his followers, uh, leading to a split that uh, still lasts today, and uh, at least um, officially in many of the same theological issues being unresolved. What is interesting though to note here is that uh, it's not some, it's just a matter of these sort of um, issues of custom or belief, though. Um, there really is uh, the fact that um, these, these areas have grown up independently of one another and all sorts of cultural differences uh, that also help uh, just sort of create and sustain uh, this split. It's not just a matter of you know, working things out on paper. What we're going to see uh, is that uh, in time, the Byzantine world is going to go into decline. Uh, and uh, we think that um, as a Byzantine world is never going to yet enjoy uh, an emperor who has quite the skill level of Basil II. And, and really, uh, in a government uh, that is an autocracy, um, it is very important who is on your throne at any given moment. The problems that the Byzantines would face extended beyond just the question of who did it. Um, the theme system that I spoke about earlier that had started this means very well for centuries. In time, uh, it's actually going to, to uh, really run into significant problems. Um, many aristocrats are going to uh, grow greedy for a larger amount of land. Uh, in fact, uh, they're actually in some cases going to uh, gobble up some of the territories of free peasants. And, uh, this is actually a very um, dangerous thing to happen. Uh, because uh, in many cases, um, these, they no longer had the uh, same numbers in their armies as they did before. But there were no free peasants to be able to, uh, uh, to, to staff these armies. Uh, and uh, that also is going to mean uh, that the tax, the amount of taxes that the Byzantines would take in would drop dramatically. Uh, because some of these aristocrats uh, essentially become hostile to the government and refuse to uh, uh, turn over tax. We're also going to see in later times uh, that the Byzantines are going to run to challenges from the West. Those, those sort of hate of the West is going to boil over into open warfare. And in fact, there's a lot of military conflict between the Byzantines and the West. Uh, the absolute worst case of this, uh, which I'll talk more about in a later session, uh, is in the year 1204, when a group of, of, of Western Europeans from Venice and France will join together and end up uh, conquering and sacking the capital city of the Byzantine world, uh, uh, the, uh, the city of Constantinople. 
Uh, and uh, although this, this city would be later recaptured by Byzantines, um, it's going to lead to the Byzantines really losing a lot of their strength and having to spend most of their energies to try to reconquer territories that used to be uh, their own. Lest I end on a completely negative note here, um, it is important to note, though, that most people would say that the, uh, uh, the influence of the Byzantine world uh, actually is much, uh, much longer lasting uh, than simply the political body or even the, uh, the government of the Byzantine world. And uh, this is in particular very important uh, for the Slavic world, Eastern European world. Uh, and in fact, it will continue even after uh, the Byzantines uh, lose their empire. Just as within Western Christianity, we think the Eastern Orthodox world put a real premium on missionary work. Uh, that you had to, well, you had to, as Jesus commanded, go out and spread the faith. Uh, and uh, in particular, um, two, uh, two brothers, uh, who later be known as saints, known as Cyril and Methodius, um, are, uh, were really instrumental in, uh, this, uh, as part of this push. Uh, and as, um, as the Byzantines uh, get more and more interested in some of the territories to the north of their empire, um, uh, in, in part because of trading, later on even because of conquest in those regions, uh, they began to recognize that there were all these people who were close to them who had never been converted to Christianity. Uh, and in fact, um, Cyril and Methodius, um, these brothers who had come from what today is modern day Greece, um, who actually knew um, uh, knew uh, Sla Slavic language or some form of Slavic language, uh, actually take it upon themselves to go and try to spread the faith uh, in uh, northern territories, uh, and specifically going to what today is modern day Bulgaria. And I guess what's a very interesting one of the things that they do, among other uh, contributions they make, is uh, when they first begin to preach, they recognize uh, that there is. Uh, no written language to uh, to take down the Slavic tongue, and so they actually um, they create a, a new alphabet to be able to represent the sound of uh, the Slavic languages, and uh, this is something that, in honor of Cyril, one of the two brothers, is called the Cyrillic alphabet. And uh, if you look closely at this, you'll realize that in fact uh, this is the same alphabet that is used today for, for instance, Russian. Um, so, uh, again, this is a language uh, that uh, has long-term importance, but it's also important for the time because um, it allows them to be able to, to translate both the Bible and the liturgy of the Byzantine world uh, into a Slavic column that they can then put in a book to be able to copy and spread uh, more widely. Um, and uh, what we begin to see, in effect, uh, is that um, the Cyrillic alphabet will, of course, ensure now uh, that Slavs have literacy. We think that um, Byzantines were some degree were already familiar in Eastern Europe uh, because so many of them had traded in this territory. Uh, but now, in effect, um, the Byzantines were also being promoted to Christianity. And uh, what you're going to see then is in most parts of Eastern Europe, the form of Christianity uh, that they will take is the Eastern Orthodox variety. And uh, that is a result, of course, of who the missionaries were. Uh, these were from the Byzantine world. Uh, so uh, in many cases, uh, both the art and architecture of uh, many places in the, in the uh, Eastern European world will very closely imitate that of uh, what uh, they had known from the Byzantine uh, missionaries. Uh, and so in time, in fact, um, especially, uh, we'll see later on, uh, with Russian princes. Uh, they will overtake Byzantine Christianity, um, and uh, at the same time, they will also begin to say uh, that we are also uh, overtaking uh, the imperial rule of the Byzantine world. So uh, Russian princes, for instance, will be very close to the church because uh, that's what Byzantines have, they control the church, and uh, they will begin to fact and say that uh, uh, they were a third row uh, Russian. Okay, so since the first row, the row of the The second row is Constantinople, which in time to fall. The third row is Moscow. Uh, and uh, we are going to carry on if they have to go. 
All right, folks, we continue on Monday. I'll say that. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.